TV event of the week was about one of Britain's most notorious serial killers. It was the story of Dennis Nilsson, retold in an ITV drama and a documentary last night uh, called Dez. Uh, so that documentary delved even deeper into his absolutely horrifying murder, showing interviews with some of those closest to the case. You were looking at yeah. it, you were hearing uh, the story there of Steve McCusker. Steve was the detective inspector who arrested Nielsen in 1983. Let's go to him now and uh, get his recollections uh, off, off that whole event and how it happened. Because, Steve, you were the man who, who collared Nielsen then in, in real life. And, and, and you're saying you open a wardrobe and it's full with body parts in black bin liners. The stench must have been awful. It was absolutely incredible, but unfortunately, it was a smell that we, as police officers, were aware of. And as soon as we walked in his door, we knew that uh, some dead body was lying somewhere within that flat. What was he like when you arrested him, when you read him his rights and things? Was he accepting of it or did he resist arrest? He did not resist at all. He was very, very calm, um, surprisingly so. Uh, and I think we were more shocked than him that he was so very quick to admit what he'd been up to. Uh, I mean, it wasn't until uh, we got into the car, I took him into the car, and it was like we were two mates heading back to uh, the police station. Um, he was just rambling on about this and that. Um, but there was something, uh, certainly in my mind, um, that uh, concerned me, and that was the size of the two bin bags. I thought, but if this man had killed someone, he certainly killed a big person. So you when know, you asked him that, because you believed, uh, Steve, you know, you thought this must be more than one, it's either a very big person or it's more than one, what did you ask him and how shocked were you at his reply? Well, I just simply said to him, I said, uh, by that time I was actually calling him Dennis, not Des. Uh, you know, I was calling him Dennis and he, said he was accepting that. And I said, Dennis, I said, uh, how many bodies are we talking about here? Uh, he said, uh, I said, one or two. He said, uh, and he just turned round to me, he looked me in the eye and he said, 15 or 16. He said, and I'll tell you all about it when I get to the station. He said, it's just good to get it off my chest. Steve, sometimes, um, you know, people would say to me, you know, what did you think of so-and-so when you met them? Sometimes you know you're in the presence of greatness. Sometimes you know, you're, you know people have a certain aura about them. Did, did you realise or did he exude an aura of evil or, did, or not? He, he, he looked weird, if that was perhaps the expression that I could use. Um, he didn't look evil, but he looked weird. Um, you know, his response to two detectives uh, calling on him and, and him being arrested for murder, and he just looks you in the eye, he, had, he really had no expression. And I thought that was weird uh, and obviously evil. How well did David Tennant capture that in the drama? It was absolutely first class. You know, it really took me back. I thought I was there. Um, in the flat with him, in the police station with him, where I sat him down, where I took his photograph. It was just something else as well, um, you know, that I, it's hard to describe it's in my mind that this case is going to be famous or infamous, whatever way you want to look at it. And I thought, I'm going to take a picture of this guy as he is now, just in case something happens. So I stood him up against the wall as we got, when we got him back to the police station uh, and I took the camera from the, uh, the charge room I just took a long, full-size photograph of him. Unusual thing to do on the, in those days. In fact, it's very unusual to do it today. Yeah. And that picture, uh, so that 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 picture's little... been used all around the world. And we've seen it so many times. How important... You said that, you know, you, you talk to him a lot. Um, how important was it to build this kind of rapport? Because it must be very difficult, because you're probably appalled by his crimes, and yet you needed him to talk. Absolutely, that's right. I, you know, I took the lead from uh, Nilsson himself. Um, you know, I just it, it, what we do when we get someone back to the police station is that we we take their antecedents, and that is we just sit down with them and we find out who they are, what they do, what they did, where they were born, have they got any brothers, sisters, 
uh, fathers, mothers, that kind of thing. So you actually build up a relationship with them anyway. I mean, you could say I was almost softening him up for the uh, upcoming interviews, uh, but he, he was in, in, a, in a reasonably good mood. Uh, one of his big concerns, of course, was uh, about his dog. He had a dog called Bleep, and he was very, very concerned about that dog. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, you had yeah. to tell him that that dog had to be put down. Well, he, he said, could uh, we look after the dog for him? And at that time, I thought, well, he's more interested and more concerned about the dog than he is about the remaining three bodies that are up in uh, the bin bags in his flat. And I said, yes, we'll look after it. So I just contacted the, the uh, dog department of the police and, and they did it. But a week later, um, I had to tell Nilsson that the dog had passed away. Um, you know, I wasn't necessarily going to tell him, but every time I saw him, he asked me about the dog. How did he respond? Very, very calmly again. He, I just uh, not as if someone had been murdered or anything like that. It was just that, yeah. oh, well, he said uh, he was always a friend to me. He never asked any questions. That's the type of attitude that unlike he had Unlike you, Steve, unlike <laughs> you, who was asking all the questions. Um, imagine, yeah. though, you're sitting at home, Kerry Danes. Kerry Danes is a forensic psychologist. She's a criminal psychologist. And you get a phone call from a serial murderer. Why did he want and why did he need Kerry to speak to you? Because he'd seen me on a documentary programme. And I think that what Nilsson really wanted to do was control the whole media story and narrative around him so he rang up to talk to me and give me his version of events and actually stayed in contact with me for a good number of years between 2008 and 2012. Kerry, you, you heard Steve talking about there how accepting he was of his dog's death even though he obviously cared for his dog. How in your view was this man so at ease with death? How was he so accepting of death? I mean to be actually physically to cut up body parts, to dispose of them, not to overly worry about the consequences. Why, what, what did death mean to him? Was death about control as well? Absolutely it was. And I think to understand Dennis Nielsen, you really have to look at a series of events during his childhood. And he had a very, very abnormal sexual development. And I don't believe that he killed because he was lonely. I believe that he killed because he was a necrophiliac in the truest sense. He was sexually attracted to dead bodies, but also being around them, being around death, made him feel very, very powerful. He had created these, what he felt were passive partners who he could wash, he could pose, he could talk to, like the dog. They never asked questions and it made him feel in control. And he... I think in the um, in the drama, he talked about when he was being interviewed that he had to be drunk to actually commit the murder. So that didn't seem he didn't seem comfortable with the murder. What he seemed very comfortable was with was once the person was dead, the death. he would then sit with them, bathe them, dress them, watch TV with the dead body. I know you can't imagine it, can you? But uh, he told me that the killing was not important to him. In fact, he found it very very difficult. What was important to him was the ultimate product that he made, which was these dead men. And he talked to me about how when he was a child, he was bullied at school because he was very effeminate and people didn't accept his uh, gayness, which he felt he couldn't hide. And there was one instant where he saw one of the boys who bullied him being pulled out of the sea because, of course, he lived in a small fishing, uh, fishing port in Scotland. And he looked at this body being pulled out of the sea and he found it very sexually exciting. But also he realised that this bully was never going to bully him again and didn't have any power and control. And it made Dennis feel very supreme, he said. It was a strange word that he used. He felt supreme, powerful and confident at that point. And from that point... He said that he used to fantasise about dead bodies, particularly dead bodies that had been drowned or pulled from yeah. the sea. Yeah, and yeah. Steve, some of his victims, uh, um, some of the, the survivors actually, said that they woke up feeling they were being drowned. Interesting. The, yeah. the press sometimes referred to Dennis as the kindly killer. What, what's a kindly killer? And there's nothing kind at all about strangling men, is there, with a tie or a garrote? No. But then 
often he would put them in the bath. And I think that what he was trying to do was recreate this fantasy of a drowning boy. Well, he himself was found dead in his prison cell a couple of years ago. Um, but, Steve, final question to you. How did he get away with it for so long? I mean, we're talking about a period, what, from 78 to 83 or so? Yeah, I think probably because uh, the people that he approached uh, were vulnerable young men. Um, a lot of the people uh, that we um, investigate and try to identify, um, we kind of established that they all had left home under various sad circumstances. Uh, and these were kind of people that uh, normally, uh, if they vanished off the face of the earth, no one would ask any questions. Uh, and I think he, that's, that's he, you know, he was premeditated in what he did. Uh, and I agree with some of the things that the psychologist is saying there. That um, you know, I think that Nilsson went down to the West End to these bars, picked these guys up with the actual intention of murdering them. Gosh. And Steve, you spent many, many hours talking to Nielsen. Um, your conclusion at the end of it was he evil or was he mentally unwell? No, I think uh, uh, he was absolutely, without doubt, evil. Uh, I, I mean, I've met. Uh, I've read many books uh, that have been written about Nilsson now, and a lot of people, in my view, seem to try and defend him for what he'd done, that it was his, uh, because his grandfather had died and that he had seen his grandfather in a coffin, um, and, and this uh, affected his life. But he was only six years old when that happened, uh, and he was 36 when all these murders happened. Uh, I think he just evil just came within him. Uh, oh. I'm not a psychologist. Uh, in the old days, he's just pure evil. And Kerry? Nasty man. Kerry, would you concur? Well, I struggle with the concept of evil, but I would say that he was somebody who was psychopathic and he was a necrophiliac. It's not a good combination, is it? No, it's not. Kerry Danes, forensic psychologist, thank you very much indeed. Steve McCusker served in the police force for 33 years and he collared Dennis Nielsen. Thank you thank very you, much Dave. indeed. Thank you.